Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Accelerated Art Programme, I'd like to wish, wish you a warm welcome to this edition of Culture Unlocked. Now, tonight, we are fortunate to have Hassan and Hussein Esip, two of South Africa's most talented young artists, with us. So, Hassan, welcome Thank this you. evening. Thank it's you great to have you with us. And Hussein, it's a real privilege to have you here. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for having us on the show. It's a pleasure. Um, it's extraordinary that you gentlemen at such a young age have achieved so much in the visual arts. Winners of the 2014 Standard Bank Young Arts of the Year Award. Um, you have work in uh, international collections. You've been on international shows uh, as far afield as Cuba, in Africa, in, in Europe. And uh, we want to find out more about your work and your lives. And I thought perhaps we could start by asking you to tell us something about um, who you are and perhaps Hassan, you would start for us. Well, we boys born and bred in Cape Town on the Cape Flats in the area called the Islands. Um, you know, we had a passion for drawing from a young age uh, and living in a quite a tight community um, from a traditional home. And yeah, we, uh, Love drawing, our favorite cartoon and comic characters. And from there, we took it further into high school where we pursued it as a subject. And um, we had a really good art teacher, which played a huge role in our lives. And we decided to study it and take it further. So, yeah, it began from a very young age, from a very small community in Cape Town. Yeah. We, we were lucky enough to, to attend the Michaela School of Fine Arts. Uh, we both graduated in 2006. Um, I graduated as a photographer and my brother graduated as a printmaker. And uh, we've been practicing and making art for the past 14 years. But eight of those years, we've been both an art teacher and an artist. Uh, we did our postgraduate certificate in education in 2000 and, uh, 2012. Yes. And what were some of the formative influences that shaped your career? Hussain, would you like to say something about that? Um, well, after graduating, we were quite lucky enough that uh, the Goodman Gallery approached us. And uh, at the time, we were not sure what we were going to be doing. I mean, we got this BA degree, we're not sure where to go from now. And, uh, with the Goodman approaching us, it, it motivated us to now conceptualize and take out te techniques that we've picked up during our fourth year. And yeah, they we, gave us. You'll the actually see break. with the, the image um, some of the fourth year work that my brother was doing. He was basically using himself and um, inspired inspired me to, to to create something else that we will show. And after graduating, being approached by the Goodman Gallery, we made some work and they were happy with it. And that's when we kind of took it further, yeah? Yeah, they, that was our big break. Um, the Goodman Gallery giving us an opportunity to be part of a group show. And, um, you know, we, they saw a, a gap in the market, I guess. And we, uh, they invested in us. So they gave us some capital to buy equipment. And, uh, and that's, that's what we did. It was just that motivating factor and that gave us that confidence to just pursue and persevere what we were doing. Do you want to tell us something about the nature of this work, the kind of approach you adopted, the media you used, um, that uh, there are so many different approaches that people utilize in the contemporary world today. Do you want to tell us something about that? Yeah. Um, so, well, initially in the fourth year, uh, can you turn to that image? Um, yeah, it's um, in our first slide. Um, what I was doing, I was experimenting as a printmaker. The idea of um, multiplying, making a copy of something was kind of embedded in my thought. Um, at the same time, we were um, in our class of about 60 students, Hussein and I, and there was another student. But we were the only Muslim students in the class. Um, and this was a bit of a challenge because our lecturers were asking us to be 
quite critical to our beliefs and a lot of our, our peers didn't know much about our religion or the community we came from. And this was the, the first science for me to actually be progressive in the sense of bringing my community, uh, places I've been to, um, to them. And the best way to do this was with the medium of photography because it was, you know, capturing those spaces and places. Um, at the same time, I wanted to recreate these, these situations I found myself in, but still respecting that I wouldn't use anybody um, else. So I decided to just use myself. Um, so with the help of Hussein, who was majoring in photography, uh, we went out and um, were f photographing myself in these spaces, and then in a studio, photographing me performing, and I would montage these images all together to create a picture. So it was this internal dialogue, this kind of struggle that I was experiencing between my traditional upbringing, but also the community and society I was living in. Um, and that's what I wanted to kind of explain in the work. Yeah. And during my fourth year, being um, exploring kind of a similar concept, but also uh, I, my lecturers didn't like where I was going with my work. And I found myself in a bit of a bad space. And when I saw what Hassan was doing with his work, it just blew my mind, knowing that you could make work using your own body. You know, it wasn't necessarily you going out and documenting people because there's an ethic behind that as well, having to ask permission and things like that. And uh, being a photographer and looking at what he was doing, initially I was struck with the idea of why not photograph on site and shoot everything manually so that you can eliminate the kind of Photoshop feel or look that his work was getting, even though he liked that and that was intentional. So I then set out to, um, I, 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 if you move to the next slide, I, I, this was the first image that I actually did called Hudu Hana. And I find it to be my pride and joy because it was, this image basically captures uh, weeks and weeks of thinking what I can do, what I can do to bring myself out of this uh, bad situation. and. Um, Having this idea, I went out and I, I set up my camera on a tripod, set up the camera manually and uh, started performing and photographing myself. And when it came time to stitching them, putting them in Photoshop and cutting and pasting, um, I was just amazed at the, the outcome and the finished product. And I remember um, showing my work to one of the lecturers that wasn't actually teaching me. And she, all she said was, well done. And that was the push and motivation I needed to go out and uh, create a full body of work for my fourth exhibition. So this is performance-based stage photography. <laughs> exactly. Um, now, I'm not sure if everybody knows about performance art, but it is a, it's a contemporary genre that um, you see so much. But this is very unique in that you are uh, performing, you're staging, you're creating photographs, and then it's put together. Do you want to say something about that process of putting it together, um, the actual... Peter, I can speak a little about that. Um, you know, so the photographs, when Hussein and I started collaborating um, together, what we would do is we would actually go and site locations, navigate spaces and so forth. Um, we would look and spend some time in the space and kind of imagine what would happen or what would take place in that space. Um, so we would speak about it quite a bit in conversation and try to imagine the picture before going out and actually taking the photograph. Once we've come to some sort of agreement, um, knowing what clothes or props is required, time of day, and so forth, after all the planning, we would then set the time and go into the space, um, locate the camera, and then do that performance, like you say. But it's, you know, it's not, you don't require great acting skills. Um, you know, because it's, it's still photography, there's no sound, you just have to kind of pull an expression or gesture for a moment and then capture it in a still. So Sen and I would take lots of photographs, each of us getting a turn um, to stand behind the, the camera and in front of the lens. And the post-production would import all the photographs and then try to, um, you know, I would say like a painting, you know, we would kind of put it all together using the elements, principles, taking composition, um, really play around with the characters we so-called um, to create a photograph that would at the end then come to an agreement. I mean, if you look at the Pitbull fight, for example, Peter, this was the first photograph my brother and I did together in 2007, the Pitbull fight. And um, 
they, like you say, we had to think of performance in the sense of actually trying to recreate this fight. So it was very difficult doing it alone. But uh, I mean, after this photograph, you were talking earlier about modus operandi, that kind of naturally came and we found out that this is, this is the way forward, you know, having to create the stage, come prepared, a lot of brainstorming, a lot of pre-preparation to the photograph, because uh, you didn't want to come onto a location and not know what you're going to do or not have the essential props that you would be ideal for that specific location. And then what is fascinating is that if you look at the broad body of your work you produced over the last decade, it is so different in mood. There's, it's humorous, it's serious, it's moving. It's um, quite remarkable, the range of um, issues you grapple with, the range of emotions that you convey. Um, what I find most powerful about your work is you speak about the world that you inhabit, the world that you know so well, the realities that you encounter. And great art, I believe, does that. It, it, it allows you to communicate something and for the viewer to be uh, forced to think about things in a fresh way and perhaps to relook at the world in a different way. Uh, with this image, Pitbull Fight, uh, uh, could you maybe talk a little bit about the iconography, the meaning of the work, how it um, reflects an aspect of what you have encountered, which perhaps many of the viewers tonight don't know about? Yeah. Peter, if I can tell you a little bit about being a twin, um, <laughs> you know, we grew up sharing everything. And when you share something, it's bound to end up in fights. You know? So we grew up with a, you know, very close, but at the same time, we'd argue and fight about everything. You know, people knew us for being quite harsh with each other. And our relationship was like, like that, you know, we, the people always describe it as like a pit bull fight. And uh, the image we wanted to create, because it was the first image we were doing together, was the image representing Hussein, my, our relationship, you know? Yeah. So for me, metaphorically, it was like this, this fight. At the same time, you know, this was also something that's happening in the community. So it, you can't take it literally, but for me and Hussein, because we're only using each other, it's our relationship towards each other. Also, you will see the clothing that we're wearing. One is dressed in Islamic garb, so it's the traditional mm. clothes you'd wear when you go to the mosque and when you pray. And this represents our upbringing, you know, coming from quite a religious home, uh, being taught by, you know, these traditional values. Um, at the same time, being in, in society with uh, kind of Western values, uh, it's nothing wrong to it, but yeah. there's this conflict between the two. And that was also, it's also represented as, as a fight. So you'll see the one side, you know, is, is kind of fighting the other. No one's really winning or losing, but this, this, this kind of balance, this limbo that they in. And I feel, I feel deep down it, 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 it is also echoing the inner struggle within oneself. I mean, you, we have this strong, strong up, uh, upbringing and uh, you, you want to be the best person you can be religiously, but at the same time fit into society, go out with your friends, have a good time. And uh, somehow growing up, being young, we always left with a bit of a guilty <laughs> conscience, but uh, you know, uh, we're always turning back to religion. And but Fridays were very important for us. You know, Friday was the, the day we got to mosque. And, and um, I, I always, I have this memory in my mind where you, you, you come to the mosque and you see people in the best designer way, you know? And uh, for me, that was so interesting, how we, how we have these multiple identities. So I think that what I would like to explore a bit further is issue you raised about um, being Muslim and, and at art school perhaps that being challenged or you being asked to be much more critical of it than, than you were prepared to be. Yeah. Um, that's uh, what I, is also interesting is I think that you have sought to um, address stereotypes about Islam and what being a Muslim is, um, uh, often ill-informed stereotypes and could you talk a bit about how you've tried to address that in your work? Um, you know, we, we try to address that by using Hollywood tactics, yeah. so to say. Hollywood really feeds our ideas mm. and the way we, the, the symbols we use. Um, you know, post-September 11, you know, we live in a society where is the image of Islam really took a, a harsh hit, let's say. Yes. People really 
uh, with Hollywood movies, um, people saw Islam as the, the new enemy. And it's people's misconception, you know, the media feeding people uh, these, these ideas. And we felt that, you know, this is something that we wanted to tackle. So in our photographs and some of the images, we, we reinforce those stereotypes. Yeah. So we play along with what Hollywood is telling us. But at the same time, we're also showing how easy it is to manipulate an image. Mm. Um, our images appear to be real, but they're not. You know, they all this, I would say these surreal images, because it can't be true. It can't be multiples of us in this space. Um, so that is also one of the ways we try to show people how easy it is to manipulate things and not to believe everything you see in the media. Yeah, I think that's important what Asin said now, like the main influence being Hollywood. Uh, a lot of the movies we've seen um, kind of uh, instilling, enforcing the stereotype. It's something that we would buy into. And a lot of the time, we would, if you're watching something and you find it a bit problematic, we'd, it would trigger a thought or it would trigger uh, an image in our minds and we would discuss it and try to recreate the image. And um, we, we do have examples of that, one being pitbull training. Now, your modus operandi, that's where you've had to set up these shoots. Um, often they're done in situations where you have to work very quickly because of uh, security issues yes. or because you're concerned about upsetting somebody. Um, can you maybe talk us through um, a typical example, say, for example, the Athlone Superette? Yeah. Um, how you approach that? putting that together? It's a good question because people don't realize everything that goes into it. So certain locations, yes, we have to kind of adopt a guerrilla style of shooting where we go in, set up and leave. Uh, sometimes we also go with the third person as just to, to watch our backs and watch our equipment. Um, majority of the time we can go to a location and ask for permission. When that happens, uh, things go really smoothly because now you actually have people that don't mind you being there and are interested in, in watching what you're actually doing. And you end up explaining and talking and in so doing, you get ideas and people will suggest things. And you know, initially you had this idea and all of a sudden it becomes this because someone has brought something new to the space. Yeah. But um, uh, the magic definitely happens in the space. When you can prepare and plan as much as you want, but once you're in that space and you, you're working in the real time, um, anything can, can happen and change. And, but I do feel that the works that were most successful were the ones that had an element of danger in it. And uh, I, there is one specific image we'll show you later. It's at the end of the presentation. It's titled Usual Suspects. And we basically came across this burnt down uh, taxi on the M5. And initially I rushed home, grabbed us in, and I was like, come, we need to use this. This is a once in a lifetime before someone comes and breaks up the taxi and takes it to the uh, for scrap metal. And we, we end up going to the site, we start shooting, um, we're performing around it, and all of a sudden this van pulls up behind us and we're now busy packing up and he's like, are you not going to take the taxi with you? <laughs> <laughs> so for me that was really nice, <laughs> thinking like uh, we made this our own, we, we took ownership of the space mm -hmm. just for that short period of time that someone would be fooled in thinking that we actually came and brought this prop in within the setting. But we had some close encounters, especially overseas where there's a language barrier. I know in, in Dhaka, Senegal, uh, we had a situation where we were photographing in a space um, and accidentally a soldier walked into the frame and he saw us take a picture. And uh, he actually got um, these this, this other security people to come in and they, they held us for quite a long time and took us to the police station. I couldn't speak a word of English and we're trying to explain that, you know, we, we, we are artists and we're there as guests and so forth. And only later, so when we were at the police station, it all got cleared up. But it was a, a really scary moment for yeah. us that uh, we, we felt that our lives were really in danger because we didn't know if they were good police officers or they wanted to take our equipment. So, yeah. you know, as, as an artist, you do put yourself in, in, in situations. Like we say, it is the, the images that uh, were quite dangerous that at the end of the day, there's this, the sense of accomplishment that you were able to capture and that, that rawness that definitely comes across in the artwork. Uh, some of the work is very um, specific to Arle Cole, um, if you think of the Athlone Cipherette. But there's other work that really interests me, such as the Cape Town uh, image you made in 2009. Yeah, uh, and I really slide. think that's something that I'd like to speak to you because both Cape Town and the Enslave Lodge both have, I believe, a kind of universal power um, 
the intriguing thing about the Cape Town image that I believe it was made during the time of the xenophobic attacks. Yes. And you have the image of these two figures, both uh, with uh, bags, looking out across the Indian Ocean. We know it was made in Cold Bay, am I right? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, standing, uh, looking across the sea. And one head is uh, tilted down in a dejected fashion. Um, and it speaks so powerfully of um, people perhaps being, um, having to embark on a journey of some kind. And the surrounding space is, um, is fairly desolate. There's no comfort there. And um, for me, that speaks to the um, migrants that face um, journeys which they, they don't wish to undertake. Yes. And I, I think it's one of the most powerful images we made, and I'd really like to discuss that. The other image, of course, is um, I find very intriguing, is the Slave Lodge. Um, and that also uh, uh, is an image that uh, is quite haunting, particularly when you begin to unpack the meaning of it. Could we look at those works and talk about them? Yeah, sure, it's on the slide, if you can put the slide on. Yeah, yeah. so cool. this is... So this is the Kope photograph you were uh, talking about. And yes, you spot on in your description of the image. Um, you described it better than what I would describe it. But yeah, um, it was in the wake of the xenophobic attacks. And uh, there was a lot of attacks happening within our area. And we were exposed to it. It was quite sad. And a lot of the foreigners were running to mosques and churches in the seek of refuge. And that's why the, the two people are actually wearing kind of an African type pattern though. To talk about color. yes, to talk about like the the African Muslims that are here, and are trying to find uh, find work or a better life, and them having to actually grab what they can, and flee for their lives because their lives were in danger. Um, it was also taken at the same time when we were traveling to Havana, Cuba. So we were also going on a journey ourselves uh, to a place that we had no knowledge of, and it was a kind of unseen uh, location. So the two tied in very well. And what I enjoy about the photographs is that they still have some relevance today. Even though they were made 2009, I still see a relevance today, even with the Syrian of issue, course. that what happened with the refugees crossing an ocean and, and, having, and, and drowning, not surviving. So um, th that for me is something really powerful with these works, that there is this kind of uh, relevance to, 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 to what is happening. Today. Is there something you wanted to say about Kope um, and the Slave Lodge? The, the Slave Lodge was a really humbling experience for me. You know, being on the island of, of Kore, um, learning about that history, um, it was, it was eye-opening. And being in that space and trying to imagine yourself as a slave, um, you know, being packed as a sardine in a room filled with people, um, going on these voyages where many didn't survive. Um, you know, you, you try to, even though you're on the island and it's all happy and, and nice, but when you just take some time and you sit there and you try to put yourself back in, in that period, um, it is a, it, it's horrifying. At the same time, it is important for people to know that it exists and it's an important thing to reflect on, you know, it's at, we, 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 we can all share that bit of history, you know? But the image itself can is we, we, we're basically yes. making like a little prayer on that pier in yes. commemoration for all the slaves that have walked that, that space of the past 100 years. Uh, years. Could we see it? Is it, is it yeah. available? Um, um, uh, let me just go, th go through the pictures. It's back, actually. No, it's, it's not. We actually don't have a problem. Uh, the, uh, the Slave Lodge. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Slave Lodge is very powerful. So yeah. I think that that engagement with place. So pr can you talk a bit about um, how you've engaged with pl uh, the significance of place? Is that something that you could... Uh, Places, is, you, you know, we... I in think the we, beginning, yeah, we were looking for interesting locations and spaces, and spaces we would actually navigate in our daily lives. I think space became really important when we traveled to the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. For remembrance, yes. Where we were tracking back or learning the um, Islamic history, you know. So yeah. these were places where people we were taught lived, uh, armies were, battles were fought and so forth. So when you enter that space, mm -hmm. that landscape becomes really important, really, yeah. very loaded. Um, and w when I was, when we, when we were traveling and visiting these spaces, um, you know, the people in it wasn't important, but capturing the space for me mm. was, was really crucial. 
And uh, the, body, the, the body of work that came out of it was called Remembrance. And you'll find in that body of work, uh, Hussein and I are really in the picture, but we try to create this window uh, for people to actually come and, 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 and be in that space. So these large panoramic photographs were produced. And when you were encountered with these photographs, nearly three meter photographs, uh, we wanted to put you into that space. Um, and people who didn't have an opportunity to go and see that space or be in that space would now have an opportunity to actually kind of get some sort of idea um, of that place. I, I just want to, to, to add a little to what Hassan is saying. Um, what we were doing before Remembrance, we basically, we set up a camera on a, on a tripod and we had a single frame and that was our stage and we were performing. But with Remembrance, it now, we moved away from using our bodies and like you're saying, focused more on the space, on the location, because we adopted a new technique and this was full view panoramic shooting. So we had a new, pan, uh, new head, tripod head, that allowed us to move a full 360 as well as 180. And uh, this was in itself kind of very um, meditative, but uh, a beautiful process of walking around and shooting. And these panoramics then were made up of four to 500 photographs that we carefully stitched together. And that in itself took about a month to do. So it became about the space and the, the location and the final product of having this beautiful print uh, that is super high quality. So when you look at it, it, it looks three dimensional. But also one of a kind, because uh, when you're capturing the panoramic, you, you don't see the end result. Only after the post-production, when you've now stitched the photograph, then you get to see if it actually worked or not. Yeah. So all this work that you were putting in to capture this panoramic, you didn't really know if it was going to work. You got to really rely on the, the skill that you've been developing and the technique. Yes. Um, also, we were in spaces that we couldn't spend a lot of time and to capture the full panoramic would take about half an hour to 40 minutes. So we really had to be precise exactly what we're doing, mm. keeping you know, a watch out, because um, some of the spaces we weren't allowed to actually photograph. So. Yeah, that's interesting. Now, there are two things I'd like to explore. Firstly, I've been struck by this picture, Night Before Eid. I find it's an extraordinary image. You, the two figures uh, uh, looking after the fires yeah. are silhouetted, what the French call contre yeah. um, uh, There's There's something very mysterious about the image. Um, it's a time, a ritual uh, activity. It's a time of great significance uh, spiritually. Um, I, I'm not quite sure that I can put my finger on why I find it so powerful. Um, but it's the light, it's the figures engaged in the activity, it's the fires, knowing something about what's being done. Do you want to just perhaps, could you elaborate on it a bit? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find, uh, explain to myself what it is that's so intriguing, but I need some help from I, you. I think it's the double meaning maybe that, you try, that you're reading into. Like for example, the darkness and the fire, that in itself has its own meaning and message. And then all of a sudden you have this silhouetted figure with a weapon in his hand, which looks like a weapon, but it's actually a spoon. So there is this kind of play with your mind of whether it's good or bad. And this is the feedback we've been getting with the specific photograph. However, I, I feel the strength also lies in the setup itself because that took a few days to set up all those uh, pots. There's about over 80 pots there. The fires itself, that's shot very early in the morning because um, they, we, they cook throughout the night because you want the food to be nice and warm in the morning. And um, so a lot of effort, work, tears, sweat has gone into the photograph. And I think that's what you're picking up on. That's why you're so drawn and attracted to it. And it's also one of our favorites. And there's quite a lot of people in the image. You just can't see them. So we've kind of blacked them out. They're all on the sidelines and they're watching Hussein and I perform, you know, and it was, yes. it, we had to brave it up and, you know, suck our pride and, and capture this performance because it was something important to represent. But like I said, I think the strength is in the setup itself because it's so time consuming. There's so many people involved to, to, to set this whole thing up um, and to capture it um, was uh, really amazing to see the, the end result. Yeah. You're using um, photography, you're using new media, you're working in a performance space. So it's very much in tune with contemporary art. Um, what I do find fascinating is that the final result can be as moving as an oil painting. Um, so much is happening in the contemporary art world. I wonder if you could uh, talk to us about what you feel um, is the most exciting area of development 
where you feel drawn to, perhaps even give um, our audience an idea of what is um, sort of, uh, what are artists preoccupied with at the moment? Is that too di difficult a question? It's a tough question, but I think, uh, I mean, I, I'm drawn to artists like William Kentridge and everybody knows him and he's also quite, con he's, he's contemporary, you know, he's, he's doing, he's the one doing things before anyone else. And when he does it, you feel, why didn't I think of that, you know? And then, so for me, looking at what he's doing pushes me, my ideas, and I, I kind of want to not be like him, but um, follow his path, so to say. And then you have people like, uh, like Robin Roder. Uh, who's also doing some amazing things with photography and, and new media. I think uh, we, we also are in a space where we've been a team for so long, we've been collaborating and relying on each other for so long, um, we've kind of separated our own thought and what we individually, because at the end of the day, we are two individual artists. Yeah. Um, and you know, you can easily get caught up as people seeing us as this, this duo, which we are, but I think we're in a, in a space in a space now that, um, you know, we, we, we need to go back to our own voices. And uh, so at the moment, you know, I'm experimenting with painting and drawing um, and photography, but with my, my own concepts and Hussein is doing the same. And, you know, I would love for the next, the next step is to actually have an exhibition that made up of two solo bodies, you know, so people could come in the space and actually see um, what, I'm interested in and, and, and what I contribute to the duo, and so Hussein too. So that's something we've been occupying, actually working on our own work, but still as, as a collaboration. You're both at the cutting edge of contemporary art. I find it very interesting, Hussein, that you spoke about uh, William, your admiration for William Kentridge, um, who seems to move effortlessly between drawing and uh, using film, yeah. using uh, and installation. Yeah, and so that's, that's interesting. In fact, during lockdown, he's been doing still life drawing. Yes, I swear. Um, so it's, and I, so what I would, I'm interested in the way you sort of gravitating back to drawing and painting. Yes. And, and I wondered if you could talk to us about how you're finding that um, return to. In, it's like going back to our, what we enjoy, you know? Um, starting out as, as artists and I think we've, you know, we, because we admire so many good painters and people that draw very well, uh, we've never had much confidence in our own. We enjoyed it, but it was for personal enjoyment. Uh, I think we're in a space where we've really uh, got that confidence to actually um, show and exhibit our mm -hmm. own painting and drawing. So we're in, we're in a good space. Um, it, it's, it is our comfort. Photography will always love. You know, and it, mm. it, it is a medium that we, we enjoy and we know, but it's the painting and drawing that, you know, the, the process, the materials, the medium, um, that just being so tangible that we enjoy and that we love. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's going back to our roots. So but it's me good. being a photographer, I, I'm still staying true to photography and even the drawing that I'm doing, uh, I, I've basically went out and did my own performances and photographed that and drawing those specific photographs. So uh, I'm trying to merge these different techniques and mediums and um, yeah, it is time for the boy band to break up. <laughs> so it, it's not really a breakup, but I, I like that idea that has proposed in the beginning of the year already saying that um, let's, have a, let's have an exhibition, but we, we come with our own kind of say our own individual works and we, we put it together. And I'm, I'm actually excited and interest, interested to see what that outcome would be, what what actually we would yeah. see in an exhibition like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fascinating listening to you two guys talk because uh, there's a real sense of youthful energy and creativity and wanting to move forward. Um, Hussein, you're going to be coming to join us, at, uh, to join bishops, mm -hmm. and um, you'll be bringing that energy with you. Uh, could you talk a bit, maybe a bit about how you um, would like to see arts move at bishops, how, what you'd like to bring, um, how you um, see art developing at, at the school under your um, leadership? Peter, I'm very excited. Uh, firstly, uh, there's big shoes to fill, but um, I, my vision for the department is one of excitement and hard work. Uh, I do feel that with my skill set, ideas and knowledge, 
I'll be able to make a positive contribution and change. Um, but my, my hopes and dreams for the department is for it to be a space of inspiration where the young inspire the old, but also that foundation for any learner to, uh, a foundation for any learner who would want to pursue a career in art, a good foundation for them. And Hassan, what about from your perspective as a teacher, as an educator, um, what do you think is the most important advice you could give to a young artist or some, a young person who's interested in the visual arts? You know, there's, there's so much to benefit from the subject, um, from the process. The, you know, we live in, in a time where everything is so visual driven. Uh, you know, people are, are, are looking for creative thinkers and art is the subject that offers it all. Um, so in my class, you know, even um, you know, I'm not grooming artists, I'm just grooming creative thinkers. And if, if one pursues the art, great. But at the end of the day, I want to do justice to the subject, share what I've learned, my experiences, um, and, you know, just uh, breed the next generation of really well-thought, well-groomed art. Because the spotlight is on Africa. You know, when we've been to exhibitions and big biennales, it is the African artists that are doing extremely well. Um, you know, there's this color, this energy that is, is, that is in the work that people want and they, they enjoy. So um, with the Zeitz Mocha, you know, putting us on the map, it is really, it's, it's really a great time to be a creative in South Africa. Yeah. Would you like to maybe mention some of the, the African artists that you've seen on your travels and your, um, in your work? You know, there's, uh, there's, there's, there's many artists, um, from Africa, if we, we know we were speaking about uh, Bartholomew Tagu, um, the Cameroon artist, uh, doing an amazing installation work. Um, what, what, what? Even in South Africa, we have amazing South African artists that uh, I was amazed that internationally they're so well known. You know, you would think South African artists, only South Africans know them. But, uh, you know, we have our greats like Jane Alexander, Sue Williamson. Um, even Robin Roder did so well for himself. Uh, we have, um, yeah, I can't even, I can't even think now on top of my head, Peter. But I, I agree with Hassan. There is this kind of demand for young African artists, and it, art, art should not be seen anymore as a subject that there's no future or no career that you can follow. I think it's a subject now that opens up, that if you pursue it with, with great passion, it can open up different career paths. Uh, even with social media today, even with where technology is heading, I feel like we need more creative thinkers to... to um, There's also, another, uh, sorry, a Zimbabwean artist, Kutsunai Charai, um, you know, also has, works with still photography and you know, shoots in the studio, very colorful. Um, doing extremely well. I had a big exhibition at the Zeit Smoker. Yeah. Um, so these, these artists are really paving the way uh, for, for, for others. Um, and yeah, bringing photography, especially a relatively new medium, as, as on, on top there, as the same le level as, as uh, traditional mediums. You know? So it's, it's exciting if Hussein, as a photographer, um, can bring that energy and that, that knowledge of photography um, to the school. Well, I'm afraid we're uh, coming to the end of our interview, but it's been so fascinating talking to you. Hassan, um, you've shared such amazing insights around um, the creative process, the uh, way in which you've worked, your vision for the, the future. Um, it's, and it's going to be really intriguing to see where you go as you pursue your perhaps uh, parallel but different artistic paths. And just saying, um, as I said a little earlier, it's been um, wonderful to listen to you talk about your work, to see the work, and simply by, by engaging with it myself, I've seen the richness, which um, I find enormously exciting. So I'm going to um, wish you all the best in your career at Bishops. I wish you a long and happy and fulfilling career at Bishops. It's going to be a big job, but you'll, um, I'm sure, um, be up to it. And, um, uh, you've got so much to offer the boys. Um, as we um, come towards the end of this interview, um, 
I just want to say how much I've learned uh, from chatting to you guys about the creative process, the insights you've gained about your work, and I hope um, for those of you who are sharing this uh, session with us that you found the uh, uh, artist's insights intriguing, that you've uh, at least uh, seen the work as something that is valuable and uh, worth um, spending time looking at. So um, I'm now going to draw this interview to a close. Um, I'm thanking our guests. Thank it's you. been wonderful to have you with us. Um, and for, from the Accelerated Art Program uh, hosts, we would like to thank you for being with us. And we um, look forward to seeing more of, the, of Hassan de Saint's work on exhibition in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Peter.